bisected laterally it's the security weekly news it's episode 393 and if you didn't get that reference oh well i'm doug white and it is friday the 14th of june 2024 well we've got trust in ai brethren and sistren and yeah amen microsoft apple moonstone sleep cheating josh marpet and more on this edition of the security weekly news this is a Security Weekly production for security professionals by security professionals. Please visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe to all the shows on our network. We interrupt our program to bring you this important It's the show that keeps you up to date on the latest security news twice a week. Your trusted source for accurate security information and expert analysis. It's time for the Security Weekly News. Make sure you subscribe to the Below the Surface podcast by Eclipsium in partnership with CRA. We've had the pleasure of speaking with some amazing guests, including Zeno Koba, Richard Hughes, Vincent Zimmer, and more. We discuss topics related to firmware and supply chain security, uncovering those pesky vulnerabilities that lie, well, below the surface in your environments. You can find all the episodes and subscribe by visiting eclipsium.com forward slash podcast or searching for Below the Surface in your favorite podcast catcher. All right. From the island of Elba, it's the Security Weekly News, and I'm Doug White. Don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button. Apparently, if you do it often enough, you'll grow hair on your palms. All right. I, 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 I was on like a total rant today looking at news stories, and I got really on this, so... Microsoft, this first one is just sort of a lead into it. Microsoft has deprecated direct access and and now is asking you to migrate to always on VPN. Now, despite for years them saying direct access was a great product, and maybe it was and maybe it wasn't, but now they're saying for security's sake in 2024, let's go to always on VPN. Now, direct access, if you're not familiar with it, was a remote access tech that they introduced back in Windows 7 and Windows Server 2008 R2 which was kind of a VPN without a VPN kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, remember when Windows didn't even have remote access capability for their server side? They had a product called Back Office, which would sort of let you get into your servers and it wasn't very secure. And then the cult of the dead cow made Back Orifice. Remember? Oh, those were the days. Let me tell you. If you don't know what Back Orifice is, you actually, well, maybe you shouldn't look it up, at least not at work, but it was an interesting product. Anyway, I remember setting up a video feed using a Linux box for a guy once so he could see the log screens on his servers at home because Microsoft didn't support any of that kind of stuff. It was hysterical. Anyway, always on VPN is a new thing that they're going to use, and it does use iKev2 and SSTP. It has multi-factor, all these things that they didn't have. Uh, So they're improving remote security for accessing all the things from home or from other offices or wherever. Now, Microsoft is advising you to plan this migration ASAP because when they deprecate something, well, they've not really said when they're going to remove it from the system. So it could be tomorrow or it could be in five years, but it could stop working very, very soon. So if you're using that to access your servers, they published a migration guide last year and suggested it. And they then suggested you should run both of these for a while to make sure you have access in case, you know, something doesn't work or something gets deprecated all of a sudden. But, you know, I mean, basically always on VPN first became available in Win Server 2016 and Win 10. It was an option you could turn on. And I mean, you know, and as a preface to all the rest of us, they don't always do the right thing from day one. Maybe that should have been the, the title of this episode. Like, you know, why do the right thing first when you could put it out in beta and wait two years? But anyway, so here's where all this went. A lot of hoopla started this week because Microsoft announced that a new feature called Windows Recall would be announced. And of course, it's AI powered. Yeah. So they initially said that this new feature was going to be released on the 18th of June, coming right up in four days, on the new Copilot Plus AI PCs. But they've now said that they will take more time to test and secure it before release. Wow. Imagine that. Now, the feature is going to be available in the Windows Insider program if you are interested. 
I mean, basically, and are you sitting down? If, if you're not sitting down, I know a lot of you listen to this in your car or on the train, so you probably are, or maybe you're strap hanging or whatever. But basically, this feature is going to take screenshots of every active window on your PC every couple of seconds. And then the screenshots are going to be analyzed by an Azure AI model to store in a database. The database is going to be local on your machine. The Azure AI thing is in some private cloud somewhere. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? I mean, I don't even know what could go right. I, I don't know what the point of this is. I'm still confused about it. They claim that the AI features are going to build a local database using this Azure private cloud, and that would allow you to perform uh, real text searches from all the data from your screenshots. So. What? I, I guess it's supposed to like help the AI develop your interests. I, I'm not really sure. I, I'm still completely confounded by what this would possibly do for me. I mean, when I first heard it, it sounded like Ford Motor Company saying, we're now going to attach a chainsaw to the steering wheel and the gear shift will be a live venomous electric snake. But, you know, you'll always have a snake and a chainsaw handy just in case, you know. I mean, I'm sorry, but I, I just can't figure out what they're doing here. But And I mean, not that they've ever made a bad decision before, but basically they're going to collect your data and see what you're doing and let an AI interpret it so that when you want something, I, I guess it would be faster than just sending it to a search engine. I mean, they spent a lot of energy talking about how the data is going to be encrypted with BitLocker and, you know, it's going to be all safe and secure and nobody will have access to it. But what I couldn't understand was why do I need this? So yesterday I was reading, so this is what I was doing yesterday. I was reading a paper about crypto. I applied for a consulting job. I bought some tea on the internet because I got asked to do that. And I worked on a presentation that I have to do in the near future. And I also worked on a project proposal. So this was stuff that I was doing yesterday. So what if all this was collected? So these second screenshots, and I have six monitors. I, I don't know how many windows I have open. If I had all this stuff open, what would this database do? What would the AI be figuring out from all this? You know, I mean, like, hey, Chithulu, what did I do yesterday? <laughs> Let me tell you. I mean, I, I, I don't know. It, it's more than It's more than a little bit horrifying to me. They called it a personal semantic index, but I just don't get it. I mean, I'm sure some of you are going to be telling me why I what I need to get, but but I mean, so but here's what happened: they backed off. I mean, it, it didn't just get released and everybody went, "Ooh, that could be interesting." No, it was like literally like we're going to put a chainsaw on your steering wheel, and then you know later Ford Motor Company goes, "We have decided we might need to do a little more studying of a of an actual chainsaw running on your steering wheel while you're trying to drive." So we're, we're going to wait and study that a little bit more. I know everybody wants a chainsaw on your steering wheel, but we're going to wait just a little bit. But basically now what they've said is when it does come out, there will be an opt-in. Oh, my God, imagine. And they're going to have more, even more encryption. I mean, oh, yeah, it's, it's sounding more trustworthy all the time. I mean, how many times do we have to hear your data is safe? We will guarantee it. And then patch 4,749 comes out. I mean, it, it's all supposed to be local, encrypted, and it won't activate unless Hello Authentication clears it from you with a DNA sample. You have to spit in a tube. I don't know. But, I mean, I guess maybe it was going to learn what I do each day and try to facilitate it. But what if it gets cracked, stolen? What if there's a zero day? What if my system has a zero day? I don't know. This is our theme for the day, let me tell you right now. I mean, maybe they just collect this and sell it to a third party for a tidy sum. I mean, they would never do that, right? You can trust these large companies to, to have your interest at heart. Maybe they're going to use it to train some other AI. They're going to train Terminators. But I'm sure they will explain it all in the 100 pages of fine print that you need six attorneys, two years of committee meetings, and another party to understand. No thanks. But I have a feeling it may be getting close to time to stop using Windows if they're going to do this. You know, I mean, now I may want to compile my own kernel and run my own systems and just say, OK, guys, I'm out. I don't trust you anymore. And since we're on this, OK, I could not resist adding to it. So Brad Smith, the president of Microsoft, was testifying to the United States Congress Committee on Homeland Security and basically said, this, I mean, this is not related to this AI thing, really, but this is what he was saying. 
Microsoft had failed, this is a quote, Microsoft has failed when it allowed hackers backed by China to access security keys, resulting in the intrusion of multiple email accounts belonging to the U.S. diplomats and the government officials. <laughs> we talked about that in a story a while back. Smith went on to admit to a security breakdown in the lead up to the attack and ultimately allowed access to Microsoft 365 accounts for government officials, which included the Secretary of Commerce. Gina Raimondo, who cropped me out of a photo one time. Thanks. But Smith went on to defend Microsoft's handling of the matter. said, you know, we, when we found there were problems, we fixed them. I'm like, yeah, after you found them and the Chinese had all the information. And, you know, and, and they said, yeah, we do have operations in China. We have facilities in China. But he said, quote, that they do not capitulate to the demands of the People's Republic and that they have the ability to refuse to hand over data and credentials, but that they do run data centers in China. And, and we do have third parties in China that have access to. Yeah, but 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 no, we won't. We're not going to lose your data. We're not. I swear for the four thousandth time, we will not lose your data. I promise. I promise. Almost. Maybe. Maybe not. Uh, should, should I have an attorney present? Oh, I have seven. OK, no problem. Well. I added another story just to make my point. Headline, Microsoft patches zero-click Outlook vulnerability that could soon be exploited. Okay, great. They, they patched it. That's good. But this security defect allows attackers to bypass Outlook registry block list and create malicious DLL files. It's a bug that can be exploited without user interaction. So just to be clear, I can inject a malicious DLL on a local system, and according to Morphosec, this can be exploited to exfiltrate data, gain unauthorized access to the system, and perform other malicious uh, activities. It doesn't require a click to execute, but it's patched. That means it was there, and now it's patched in the Tuesday release this week. But how many other bugs have happened this year? There were 83 patches just in this month's release with two zero days. And sometimes the patches have security flaws in the patches for the security flaws. I mean, they do that all the time, right? So I guess my point is, do I really trust them to capture screenshots of everything on my system constantly and save that information on my system and run it through a private cloud AI because it's encrypted? And then five years from now, they go, oh, you know that encryption we were using? Yeah, that wasn't very good. We're going to release a new encryption now. You always use any, always on VPN. I mean, how long before a patch is released for the new Copilot Plus AI that they say, oh, this might have allowed the Chinese, Russians, and Argentinians to access everything on your system, including every screen you were ever on forever, and they have it as an, and an AI is interpreting it for them, and they had access to this, but we, we fixed it now. I mean... Now, granted, everything's sitting here on my system right now and encrypted, so you know it's probably just waiting to be exfiltrated anyway. So I'm probably already screwed, and that whole letter I wrote to Ronald Reagan back in 1984 is going to get leaked, and you don't want to know about that. Hint, there were nudes. But, okay, one more just for emphasis. Our old friends, Black Basta, beat Microsoft to a patch punch and exploited a privilege escalation bug as a zero day, according to Symantec. This one was in the Windows error reporting service that was patched back in March, and the vulnerability allowed the attacker to elevate privilege to the all-powerful system level during the attack. Yow! That one would allow the attacker to go from an individual user account to the admin account and take over the home machine. Black Basta ransomware was said to have used this to compromise victims before it was patched. I mean, but hey, trust us. We assure you we're doing everything we can. I mean, and I'm not bashing the programmers because I know how bugs work and I know how the modern age works. And we've been dealing with Microsoft since Windows 3.0. And yes, they release it, then they patch it. Everybody does it. But look, I don't really want to give you everything, right? But hey, not to just bash Microsoft today. Okay, let's shift gears. I've been bashing them now for, I don't know how many, too many minutes, right? Uh, Apple has been moving down this road as well. Apple announced that they were going to partner with OpenAI, a third party, to bring ChatGPT to Siri on Monday. What? So now they want to put an AI in your phone. Let me guess. It's going to monitor your every move and make things better by reporting them all to a private cloud, which is encrypted, and nobody will ever have access to it. We promise, except Open OpenAI, who will have access to it. But, hey, here's another legal document you need to read that will tell you that they don't have access. 
sorry, I'm feeling a little bit ornery about AI today and, and these big companies telling me how safe it all is. I mean, I love new tech and I love AI. I, I assure you I do. But I'm always suspicious when they start using words like facilitate and collect your data in the same sentence along with third party. But don't worry. We only have your best interests at heart. No way we would ever, ever screw up and allow somebody to get access to your data or sell your data or let the Chinese government force us to give access to the data. You know, maybe a guy named Rupert wants to give us a billion dollars for it. And we would never do that. Come on. It's AI. You want it. You love it. You need it. Because what kind of phone doesn't have AI? And what kind of loser doesn't have AI? And what kind of loser phone does that loser use? For once, Elon Musk and I agree. And, you know, that they collect what you're doing. They allow it to be an open AI. This is what Elon said on X. They allow it to be an open AI. And there is now multiple agreements that the user has to review. What does open AI do with your data anyway? What does Apple do with your data? What are they tracking? Elon had stopped by this time, but I'm going on. Maybe it's time for a tinfoil hat and a flip phone. I mean, I'm getting there, right? I'm like, literally, I don't even do anything interesting. I mean, I mean, you know, people are always like, what are you up to, man? I'm like, nothing. I'm boring as hell, but why do they want my data? But they do. Now, Apple says they will keep the data safe. I mean, there's like, must be corporate boilerplate for this now. Apple says they will keep your data safe and inaccessible to anyone other than you. And that even Apple itself will not have access to data passing through that private cloud. But I kind of think Elon's point is they say that. But then OpenAI has access to the data. They have to. And since OpenAI is accessing the data, that means the data is in OpenAI ChatGPT. And that means ChatGPT, who maybe didn't agree to the legal document, decides to share that information with third parties. And then Bob's your uncle. I mean, Apple's always been pretty privacy-oriented, to, to be fair. But, I mean, what happens to all this data? Valuable data. Apple says that OpenAI will not store the prompts and IP addresses of anyone accessing ChatGPT through their phone in iOS 18. But OpenAI has said a lot of things, and so has all these corporate companies in front of Congress. No, sir, we never intended to allow this to happen, but it did happen. Mistakes were made, and we're very, very sorry, and we promise it will never, ever happen again, and we'll release patches next week. Oh, and also, we just should let you know that all your phones have been compromised by the Chinese. Just saying, but we're sorry. We promise we're sorry. We're very, 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 very sorry. Yeah. I mean, that must be the CEO interview, right? It's just like, how, how well can you say sorry and how many times and how fast? I mean, Elon's probably overreacting because, you know, imagine that. And, and me overreact, be a drama queen? <laughs> no way. But it's really hard to trust all these organizations that want to sell your data for a fortune who say they don't want to sell your data. But, you know, the CEO needs a new 100-meter yacht for when the backup yacht is being cleaned and the main yacht isn't available due to those pesky blood stains in the cabin. But unlike Microsoft, Apple did pretty much take the full vertical integration of the security on this and all the data, even in root, apparently. And they said it's all encrypted, that they can't access it either. Nobody can get to it. But I've heard those stories before. But so technically, if you're asking chat GPT via iOS 18 how to remove all DNA evidence from a large yacht stateroom and dispose of biological material safely, it would technically only be on your device. It would all be encrypted when it's not on your device because they just contradict themselves like that. They say it's all on your device, but oh, but it has to go to the, cl the cloud to be processed. I'm like, okay, so it went from my device to some other place, and then they had it, and then it came back to my device, and then, huh, but it's all encrypted, let me tell you. But this is the same pitch that Microsoft is using, too. So this is coming. I mean, I mean, I guess my whole point with all these crazy rants is that this is coming to soon to a theater near you, and your choices are going to be use it, roll your own, and go live in a cabin in the woods, wear a tinfoil hat, and your company is going to be subject to this, too. And if you think this isn't valuable data, boy, are you naive. We're probably going to need to think and talk about this a lot, because how long is it going to be before one of your employees gives up their database by accident or they install malware on their phone? And even though they had all this security around it, that database gets exfiltrated because that's going to happen. I mean, it's there. And that means somebody's going to give it up or there's a zero day or who knows. All the encryption in the world's not going to protect it if some 14-year-old kid guesses their passphrase or there's a flaw in some other component that allows it to be compromised. 
I still can't figure out what they would get from me. It's probably going to be pretty boring, but at least some of it might be proprietary. Some of it might be a violation of FERPA and it could be embarrassing or all the above at once. I mean, I think what they never told you was that the Terminators didn't kill everyone because they were Terminators. They killed everyone because they read all their mail. Yeah. And along those lines, Apple did patch Vision OS, and I only bring this one up because it's kind of interesting, but I also like to keep saying how many times they patched up. You know, but they're not perfect either. Vision Pro, if you don't know what it is, powers the Vision Pro headset. And guess what? Even if your optic nerves are at risk from being hacked, well, read Snow Crash if you don't know what that all means. But the vulnerabilities in the advisory can lead to arbitrary code execution, information disclosure, privilege escalation, and denial of service in a, in a VR headset, which sounds pretty crazy. Some of these are found in iOS, Mac OS, and, and TV OS as well. So they've got bugs everywhere. They've got flaws everywhere, and it's really, really scary. But only one of them was specific to Vision OS, and that one could allow specially crafted web content to lead to a denial of service on the headset. Ryan Pickering, who reported the flaw, confirmed that it was specific to Vision Pro and said he believes, and, and this is really why I brought this up, that it is the first ever spatial computing hack. Pretty cool. How many flaws did they patch this year? But again, trust us with everything, including your optic nerves. Oh, well, I guess we already do. I mean, enough about that. I'll, I'll, I'll stop ranting about that now. Um, yeah, I, I, I really will stop, stop ranting about that now. Um, all right, something else. And now for something completely different. Moonstone Sleet is a new North Korean hacking group with a cool name. I like the name. Uh, it might be my porn name or that and or, you know, Amorphous Lump. That's my porn. That's my porn name. Amorphous Lump. But they are distributing a malicious node package manager to public registries. And, I, and this story is related to all this to me as well. But they're targeting the software supply chain by poisoning open source code repositories. And guess who uses these things? Developers. And developers are telling you everything is safe. Yeah. But remember how a long time ago poisoning a well was considered one of the greatest crimes you could commit? Well, I think we're getting there again. Moonstone Sleep first showed up last month, and Microsoft revealed that the group was engaged in espionage and financial cyber attacks using a variety of techniques against aerospace, education, and software organizations and developers. And one of their main tactics was to try to get hired for remote tech jobs at real companies. They take real jobs by real people and get in. Then they would give them, that would give them the basis to spread NPM packages that are leaked in on other websites right? Because they're valid. They work for a company that has a legitimate domain. Check marks reveal that they are more widespread already, and they're placing those packages in public open source package repositories. Check marks said they were different than Lazarus, who is also called Jade Sleep, by the way. That package is being delivered by Moonstone Sleep is different from Lazarus packages and would imply it's a different North Korean group from the long established Lazarus. Now, your devs are using packages, I assure you. They make sure that you have mechanisms to vet these things. And look, you're going to have to vet your remote employees as painful and as expensive as that may be, because this is going to work. They get you to hire them. They come in, they've got your domain, your email, and they upload packages onto public repositories. Those are downloaded and put into other software and boom, big problems. And since we kind of had a theme today, this other story is about an AI startup that is checking other AI systems for vulnerabilities because, you know, AI's being added to everything. I even saw, I lit, I'm not making this up. I saw a cat litter box that said it was AI enhanced. Now, I don't know what that means. I hope the poor AI doesn't realize what a grim job it just got assigned. But yeah, so the company's called Haze and it's only five months old and they've been testing Pika, ChatGPT, Dolly and others. And they were testing the AI to see, well, what can go wrong? They found that they could produce sexualized content. Imagine that. Violent image? No. Get instructions on how to produce chemical and biological weapons to amaze your friends? No way. And automation of cyber attacks? I guess they never used the actual internet before. But don't get me wrong. I'm glad they're testing it. But are you really surprised? I mean, basically, they said that despite all the efforts of companies to protect users from these products, quote, it's still super easy to coax these models into doing things they're not supposed to do, that they and they are not safe. Hayes calls themselves red teamers for AI, and I suppose we're going to be needing a lot of that going forward. Well, he mounted the parapet again and gazed out over Dublin Bay, and there he saw the bard, 
Josh Marpet. Hi, Josh. Hey, how you doing, Doug? Everything good? You know if I'm you know if I start quoting Ulysses, I have to read that to calm me down. So I I I'm I'm like that's why I'm asking if you're good. You were ranting a little bit about privacy and about data and and I'm really sorry, man. I'm really, really sorry. I, I, I got to tell you, because my story is about a whole new way that privacy is dying. So um, hey, privacy is dead. Long live the privacy. Yeah. Well, in, in Europe, especially because they have uh, GDPR, they have some significant privacy laws. Meta, uh, the, the website previously known as Facebook, uh, is now has a new model, a new subscription model. You can pay or you can have your privacy destroyed. So they're calling it pay or okay. So you either consent to tracking, not just ads, tracking of where you are going or you have to pay. This is, I, I, I can't even tell you how horrible this is. Look, I realize that if it's free, you're the product. Look, we've known this for how many years now? I mean, Doug, you've been telling people this for like 50 years or something, all right? So I mean, Doug's old, like really old. Unlike me, I'm very young. Uh, so, <laughs> but we've been saying that if you're, if it's free, you're the product for a very long time. And you get that if you're a Facebook user and I'm going to pick on Facebook because they're the focus of this model. But if you're a Facebook user, it's free to you. Well, they've got to make the money somehow. So they have lots of ads. They have lots of promoted stuff, which people pay for. They're effectively sort of mini ads. And they sell your viewing habits to advertisers. What does that mean? It means that when you go on and see ads, they are targeted not just for anybody on Facebook, but for middle-aged white guys who look at smoked meat commercials and, and click, you know, and, and, and comment on their friends' posts of, you know, smoked meatloaf wrapped in bacon or something. And here, look, here's a Traeger pellet grill advertisement. And that's, I'm okay with that. But then there's the ones where it's, uh, you know, you, you get seen in one photo with a MAGA hat on and all of a sudden you're bombarded with buy gold from Alex Jones or something. And, and it's, it, it's, it's mini echo chamber. They call it uh, hyper local advertising, I think was the term that was used. So they're able to localize you as not just where you live, but who you are as a person to the extent that it's absolutely terrifying. And we've known about that for a while, but now either you get consent to get tracked throughout your entire web journey by Facebook. Not that they didn't do that before, or so I've heard. Uh, but you have to pay if you don't want to be tracked. You don't get the option of, hey, I'm not going to be tracked and I'm not going to pay. I just, I want to use your product. Leave me alone. Let me go. Nope. You either get, you either pay or you get tracked throughout your entire web journey. This is terrifying. Absolutely terrifying. Basically, what you're saying is, do you want these free services that we paid for with advertising before? Yeah. Great. So you got to pay us for them. But, but I thought you said they were free. Oh, they're only free if you allow us to take more of your information and sell it to more people. The only, the, the, seriously, the only market I can actually sort of analogize this to is TVs. TVs are so cheap because they do not make money on the hardware anymore. They don't make any money on hardware. They make money on selling your viewing habits to other companies. Seriously, this is not a joke. Do you want to know the fun part? I have Apple TVs. Why? Because Apple TV is the only one that doesn't sell your viewing habits as far as I know. Okay. So, so Apple is just as screwed up. Absolutely. I, I, I agree with you, Doug, but a uh, little less than Roku. They were some of the worst at selling your, your habits as I understand it. And, uh, and so on and so forth. So we use Apple TVs because of it. So the point here is, is that privacy is, well, it's terrifyingly bad and it's getting worse. As Doug said, privacy is dead. Long live privacy or, or, the, or no, sorry. Privacy is dead. Long live profits. The new king of privacy. Okay. The, uh, the idea of trading your privacy for money effectively is actually going to court in Europe because now they're saying it is a, um, it's basically, it's, it's a contract of adhesion. You, you either have to pay or you can have some, uh, or you lose your privacy. There's no middle ground. There's no way. It's 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 a uh, it's a contract that you're not able to do anything out oh, anything with other than simply uh, freely given consent. You're forcing users. You either pay to get privacy or you don't get it at all. There's no way to get freely free consent or freely given consent because you're you're being forced to make a choice there. In the U.S., we call that a contract of adhesion. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, but that's what I believe it to be. Okay. 
Uh, Meta's had many breaches. Every Google and Microsoft has had breaches. You might have heard about a couple of those recently from a guy named Doug White. Just saying. But big tech, I, I love this sentence. Big tech won't protect consumers, users' data. The evidence is clear. Yep, absolutely true. Okay. And so are you using a, a privacy browser? Are you using a VPN? Are you using, what are you using to protect your privacy? I mean, considering the amount of porn that Doug consumes, he needs a lot of privacy, okay? So we've got to make sure that Doug has the privacy that he needs to consume his porn in the privacy of his own home or his office or, oh, Doug, stop, not right now, okay? And uh, so you need to use some form of privacy-focused browser, some form of privacy-focused system, uh, portable Firefox, uh, incognito, oh, wait, never mind, incognito isn't actually incognito. Wasn't that a story a couple of weeks ago? So it's, it's a terrifying situation we find ourselves in. Do you live in a fishbowl as everybody under 30 seems to think is normal? Or do we actually try to have something called privacy, which is everybody over 30 seems to think is normal as well? It's a very interesting turning point or crux that we're at right now. And we're going towards the fact that privacy is not a right. Privacy is simply not there. Frankly, I think it is a right, but I'm weird. Apparently, to, to have privacy, you have to be weird these days. And millions and billions of people are giving privacy away in the name of convenience. And I think that's a bad choice. Back to you, Doug. Thank you, Josh. And I, I will, as ever, plug The Light of Other Days. It's a Arthur C. Clarke book that was sort of a thought experiment exploring the idea that what if it was impossible to have any privacy at all. And... Uh, it's a very interesting book uh, about how society deals with the fact that suddenly a discovery means that you have literally no privacy, that anyone can see you anytime and you can't control it. And we're, we're getting there. Uh, I, I mean, like, I, I agree with you that, that I think that's a, it's a generational thing and it has, it is a changing norm, but it's also a very scary thing that you're just a product. And I would, I would also mention The Space Merchants by Frederick Pohl, who wrote another very interesting treatment of what happens when the marketing people take over and you're, just, you're, you're a product. So scary stuff. Pass some laws, guys. Help us out here. Uh, but thanks, Josh. And finally, a Turkish student was arrested and detained for developing an elaborate scheme to use an AI and hidden devices to help him cheat on entrance exams. I, this always kills me, but you would not believe the links students go to to cheat. You probably would because you may have known some of these people as well. I mean, let me tell you, I've seen people, you know, caught cheating or cheating who spent way more time on the cheating than they would have had to spend if they just studied the material and got an A. But, you know, whatever. The students in jail pending a trial in Isparta, where according to the police report, the student had a camera disguised as a shirt button. That was connected to AI software in a cloud via a cellular modem that was hidden in their shoe. Now, the system, when they leaned over the test, scanned the exam question using the camera, sent that to this, they didn't name the AI model, and then the AI generated the correct answer and read it back to the student through an earpiece. And there's a video demo in this article. If you want to see just how elaborate this is, the police demonstrated what this person was doing. I mean, you, you could have just, you know, studied for the exam and not ended up in a Turkish prison. I mean, anybody seen Midnight Express? Come on. I don't know how biased it is, but I, I mean, seriously. But that is it for me. I will return after the 4th of July. Uh, but in the meantime, we will have vaults next week for Juneteenth. Josh and Aaron will be on while I'm away in the lovely country of Finland. Uh, and I will be at the Cyber Warfare Conference in Javaskala in Finland on the 27th of June. If you're going to be around there, you can let me know. But then the week after that's the 4th of July holiday, so we'll have more vaults. Have fun with all that, and I will see you soon, most likely. Bye.